<clears throat> Hi, everybody. My name is Paul Sherman, and I'm a cardiac electrophysiology at uh, Houston Methodist with AVE. <clears throat> and I also um, work at the VA hospital. So those are the two main places you can find me. And um, I'm going to give you a quick approach of why complex tachycardia. Okay, so um, so the, the fundamentals we're going to go over, basically what we define as a white complex tachycardia is any heart rate above 100 with a QRS uh, greater than 120 milliseconds, okay? So you're going to be probably called a lot of time for this to go assess on a patient. The first thing you have to do as a cardiologist or related to the cardiovascular system is to check the pulse. We don't talk to the people, we check the pulse. And that's a skill. Believe it or not, you're the best guys to stop a code because you are the person who can really sense pulses. You know where to look and how to feel them. You have been trained the most for it. So that's what you can really get the best out of helping a team on a code situation. And don't waste time on looking at EKG if the patient has no pulse, right? That will be embarrassing. So the first thing when you get a, to see a patient with complex tachycardia, go check a pulse. If the patient has no pulse, should be treated like a ventricular fibrillation with the fibrillation, and you have to go to the ACLS algorithm that all of you are very well certified, okay? Now, it's possible that now the patient has a pulse, but he having symptoms like lightheaded dizziness, he won't feel good, he's maybe passing out, in and out, and that should be treated like unstable, okay? And that's, you got to follow the, the treatment algorithm for ventricular tachycardia, I recommend if the patient is alert that you sedate the patient before the shock because he will remember you if you shock him without sedation. And you will be a famous doctor who shocked the patient without sedation. So it doesn't have to be completely out, right? It's an it's a urgent situation, but a little bit of sedation helps, okay? Just a tiny little verset you can use is an in and out situation, quickly reverse. So that's my recommendation. So that's your first step when you go see a patient with white complex tachycardia. Okay, so the beauty about white complex tachycardia is that the differential diagnosis is very narrow, okay? And I put you a, a list here that has almost 100% of all the cases. Uh, the most common is ventricular tachycardia by far. Then you have SBT with aberrancy. Then you have pre-excited syndromes. <clears throat> then you have pacemakers, electrolyte abnormalities, and uh, they use an antiarrhythmic drug like Dr. Lamb uh, pronounced already. So the beauty about it is that with history, you can almost rule out three of them, okay? You can rule out pacemakers, you check the labs already, you rule out electrolyte, and you check the, the, the medication of the patient, and you already rule out antiarrhythmic. So you're basically down to three most of the time, okay? So out of those three, the most likely one is gonna be ventricular tachycardia, okay? So the clinical history, <coughs> really, if the age is above 35%, is that's one of the numbers we use to consider more likely ventricular tachycardia. In younger ages, you have to consider more pre-excitation, okay, or SVT with aberrancy, okay? The symptoms are not helpful, okay? They are not. You can have VTs very well tolerated, and you can have SVT making people pass out, okay? So don't go by symptoms. Okay, presence of underlying heart disease. This is key, all right? If you have somebody with heart disease, prior MR, heart failure, you almost better not look at the EKG, you just treat that as a ventricular tachycardia, because 90% of the time. That has been corroborated with studies, okay? They're retrospective, they're observational, but that's the evidence that we have. If you have any evidence of a structural disease, your chances of having ventricular tachycardia is extremely high. It's like the prevalence of the disease goes up, so the positive predictive value goes up, okay? Like I say, by the history, um, pacemakers and antiarrhythmics and labs, that's easy to check. You just look at the computer, look at the x-ray, or look if the patient has a wound check or something. Now these days with the lead list, you may not have to consider doing the x-ray. Uh, the use of antiarrhythmic, again, <coughs> uh, on the chart and the labs. The important is the potassium, the magnesium. Also, um, I didn't put it here, but um, you have to consider if the patient has history of long QT syndrome or something like that, okay? All right, uh, an exam, the only thing that can help you on the exam is the presence of cannon wave. And believe it or not, they're not easy to see because they're intermittent, right? This is not all the time cannon wave. It's, 
In this case, is you're looking for ABV synchrony, okay? And you're looking for that forceful contraction of the agent with a closed tricuspid valve, and that doesn't happen with every B, all right? So I think it's a, it's a waste of time for looking for canonate, but if you have a skinny person and you wanna be thorough, you might as well. That's the only finding that can help you on that. I don't recommend carotid sinus massage on the white complex tachycardia <coughs> unless you are 100% sure that this is an SVT. <coughs> if you really think this is an SVT, it's a young person, no structural heart disease, and goes over the morphology and criteria that we're gonna go for the EKG, go fine. Do a carotid sinus massage. If it's an elderly person, just remember to listen for Bruit. Believe it or not, after 60, 65, they're gonna have a plaque, most likely probable. So you don't wanna do more harm, okay? About termination with drugs. <coughs> so really, if, if the patient has been treated prior and they say, uh, yeah, my tachycardia is terminated with beta blockers, calcium channel blocker, digoxin, or adenosine. I went to the ER, they gave me adenosine, terminated. Very likely suggests SVT. We do have white, uh, we do have ventricular tachycardia that are adenosine sensitive, but the likelihood of using that is pretty low. If it terminates with lidocaine, really suggests ventricular tachycardia. Uh, if it terminates with amio or procanamide, it's a hit and miss, could be either or, okay? All right, um, so I brought you this slide um, about the EKG pearls. I'm gonna go for the EKG pearls and then we're gonna shoot a round of EKG pretty quick. So here you can see a, a run of uh, ventricular tachycardia. This is a combination of the morphology of this bead and this bead, so that's a classic example of fusion, okay? And then we have here the Dressler bead, or, or, or other known as the capture beads right here, okay? You can see they're very narrow and they're followed by a P wave right there, okay? So this is a good, it's a, it's a pretty clean example of what is a fusion, a capture, and then after that continues the ventricular tachycardia, okay? So capture beads, fusion beads, that's all suggestive of ventricular tachycardia. If you find them, you're lucky because you have a diagnosis, but most of the time we don't find them. We have to rely on other measurements or other characteristics. So. The negative precordial concordance is strongly suggested of ventricular tachycardia rather than positive concordance because the energy goes from the apex to the base so that you would usually give you that negative concordance. And the positive concordance was telling you is that the energy goes from the base to the apex. That could be any SVT or VT. So really negative concordance is more. We talk about AV dissociation. If you see the presence of P wave, um, there are marching out to the, to the electrogram. Initial R wave um, positive in AVR. So as you can see here, and that goes along with the same principle about the negative concordance, you have a very tall positive a AVR, is meaning that the energy is coming from the apex to the base, so no SVT can really do that, okay? And the RS, um, more than 100 milliseconds. And I brought this EKG because it has the, the RS greater than 100 milliseconds. It clearly had the negative concordance. I was looking for some of the P wave, but I don't see it right now. Okay. Well, I, I show you another one. Uh, you can see clearly the P wave. Okay. Market regularity of the RR interval suggests atrial fibrillation. That has to be market. Cannot be slight. If it's a slight, it could be just ventricular tachycardia. Regular RRs intervals could be any of them. Could be SVT or ventricular tachycardia. Right superior axis deviation, um, northwest axis strongly suggests ventricular tachycardia. Right bundle with a left axis suggests ventricular tachycardia. Left bundle with right axis suggests ventricular tachycardia. My right bundle with normal axis suggests or not SVT, okay? All right, the only exception caveat for the axis is when you have prior MIs. If you have prior MI, Access can change, right? Okay. All right, so uh, there are many criteria algorithm out on their books. I think the Wellens is one of the most useful, uh, the most common, um, if you wanna uh, have something, and it's pretty, what I like is that it's, 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 it's a stepwise process. Like others one are stepwise process. There's, there are many that just rely on one lead. There's only one algorithm based on one lead, is that the AVR, that's the newest. But this is, I think, is the most common use. Uh, if you can see, we talk about AV association, capture beam, and fusion, negative positive concordance. Those all things favors ventricular tachycardia. 
Now, if you have a right bundle configuration and your QRS is greater than 140, that suggests it's OVT. If you have left axis, the same. These are the morphology suggestive of ventricular, to, uh, ventricular tachycardia. Usually, the rabbit ear is the later portion, the tallest, not the earliest. As you can see, if you have a small Q and an R or a tall R and B way, that's all very likely of ventricular tachycardia. Okay. Now, on the on the V6, if you have a small R and a deep S, or if you have a QS like here in V6, okay? Left bundle, you you allow a little bit more longer the QRS to be considered ventricular tachycardia, and again, right axis deviation. Then we have this. If this, the first R wave is more than 30 milliseconds, very suspicious of ventricular tachycardia, the presence of a notch. If the interval from the peak of the R to the bottom of the S, if it's greater than 70 milliseconds, also suggestive, and again, if this and this is above 100, you put the two intervals, also is ventricular tachycardia, and any presence of Q wave in V6 is suggestive of ventricular tachycardia. So, I give you some fundamentals, okay? And I think I, before these five minutes, I have to show you some EKGs real quick that you need to have on your head when you see a, a patient with Y complex tachycardia. So this is the first one. Dr. Lam already showed you this. This is a pattern recognition. Y complex tachycardia, very irregular. Market irregular, okay? This is somebody with AFib and a pre-excited syndrome, okay? So WPW with atrial fibrillation. But we treated it with procainamide already, the professor illustrated. Now, this is very different from this, right? Don't mix it over, all right? This is Y complex. <laughs> it is irregular. All right, but it's completely different, okay? It's a pattern recognition. The, here you can see as um, <coughs> what we could consider polymorphic ventricular tach tachycardia. And also you can see that they could be considered torsad because they might some, some axis significant changes. So this is an example of torsad the point, okay? And the beauty about torsad the point that the diagnosis is, is very narrow. Usually it's prolonged QT, low magnesium. Those are the usual causes of it, okay? What about this one? They're going to call you, oh, patient is in sinus tachycardia. You see clearly P wave and B1. This is also pattern recognition. Look at the tall peak T wave right here, okay? That's already flashing your alarm. Then why QRS and prolonged PR? If you put all that together, that's hyperkalemia. That's something that you have to also uh, recognize, okay? What about this one? This is another classic pattern recognition. If you see it, you have to jump on it, and you have to think about the joxin toxicity. All right, this is what we call bidirectional VT. As you can see, their axis completely changes, but the second beat and the fourth beat are very similar, and the first and the third are equal. So this is too far in focus, and that's usually classic for the joxin toxicity, Anderson 12 syndrome. Um, DOSET 2 and CPVT, catecholamine polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, DOSET 2. So, but it's very narrow. It, 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 they ask you the first thing, the most common is the joxin toxicity now these days. Okay? What about this one? Strike forward pattern recognition. <coughs> okay, this is a Y complex tachycardia, but as you can see very clearly, there are spikes before every QRS. You don't see a P wave before the spike, so most likely it's embedded on the T wave, okay? <coughs> so this is pretty common for PMT. What is PMT? Pacemaker mediated tachycardia. So is the pacemaker originating the problem? Usually you recognize it because the heart rate is above the upper rate limit, okay? So it's usually 120, 130s, and there's a spike before. So if you see incessant episode, white complex tachycardia, and there's a spike before, think about pacemaker mediated tachycardia. And the last one that I have for you. So everybody will think, oh, this has um, relative normal axis, has the classic left bundle. This most likely is SVT. Yes, that's what I want you to think, but it's not SVT. Let's go over a little bit. So first of all, there's clearly P wave dissociation, AV dissociation here. You see that? That negative P wave there, so the V rate is faster than the P wave. So that's ventricular tachycardia, but hold on, looks exactly like the left bundle, where there is bundle branch reentry ventricular tachycardia. So this is an example of bundle branch reentry ventricular tachycardia, okay? So not all that looks like SVT is SVT. All right, 
With that being said, I'm on time and done. Thank you very much.